Welcome to today's special Roots Magic webinar. My name is Michael Booth, and I'm Vice President of Roots Magic and one of its developers. And Bruce Busby, also known as the Roots Magician, is also with us tonight. And this evening, we have a special treat. We are once again joined by the lovely Lisa Louise Cook. And Lisa is the producer and host of the Genealogy Gems podcast, an online genealogy audio show at www.genealogygems.com. And she's also the author of the new book, which she'll be showing us tonight, as well as the Genealogist's Google Toolbox and the DVD series Google Earth for Genealogy. She's also an international conference speaker, a writer for Family Tree Magazine, and an instructor for Family Tree University. And she's also just an all-around fun person with a great enthusiasm for genealogy. And tonight's topic is how to find your family history in newspapers. And newspapers are a fantastic source of research leads, information, and historical context for your, for your family history. However, finding the exact newspaper you're looking for can seem daunting. Now, there are many classes that can tell you what you can find, but now not how to find it. But tonight, Lisa will show you the specialized approach that is required to achieve success in locating the news on your ancestors as well as three cutting-edge tools that will help you get the job done. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Lisa. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers. We're going to get the scoop from these old newspapers. And um, thank you so much, Michael, for the wonderful intro. And congratulations to Michael, who just welcomed a new addition to his family. So um, I'm thrilled to, about that, and she's absolutely adorable. Um, in this webinar, we are going to spend some time answering some questions about newspapers. And uh, let's see if we can get my slide to advance here. Just one moment. There we go. All right. Well, here's my theory. Friends don't let friends search aimlessly for newspapers. And um, that is the whole premise behind why I published my book this year, Everything You Need to Know About How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers. Um, what I found as I was kind of looking to see is this, you know, it's, it's a topic of personal interest to me. I, I absolutely adore newspapers, have used it so much in my own research, but I wanted to make sure that this was a topic that was uh, something that was needed by other genealogists and that there wasn't already something out there. And as I searched, what I found was there really hadn't been a, a full comprehensive book on the subject for about 25 years, which of course means that it really didn't obviously include the internet and all of the resources that are available to us now as well. And um, I also found as I went into Google Books, I was doing some searching through the 10 years of Ancestry Magazine archives that are digitized and available online at Google Books, and that's a little gem for you if you don't know that they're out there. Uh, Google Books is a free online website that you can go in and type in Ancestry Magazine, and you'll find all 10 years of uh, issues are digitized and searchable. So I went and searched for the term newspapers, and what I found was lots of articles on, oh, be sure to check newspapers, but very, very few talking about how do you do that. And in fact, I hear that a lot in presentations, you know, that newspapers are kind of a, a side note. You know, by the way, be sure and check those, you'll find kind of great stuff. But it is a lot more complicated than it sounds. And if you have ever tried your hand at newspaper research, you may have found a little bit of frustration there. So hopefully we are going to, to clear that up. In this session, you're going to learn what, first of all, you can find. And while you're probably familiar with many of these items, there is a kind of a comprehensive list. And since you're going to be out there putting so much effort into locating the newspaper and going through it, whether it's online search, whether it's cranking a microfilm reader, going through a microfiche, whatever it is, um, it's a good idea to really have a good sense of what's available because as your eyes are passing over these pages, we don't want to miss anything uh, that's really cool. And we are going to have three cool tools for identifying newspapers. That's the big question. You know, we know who our ancestor is, but which newspapers were available in the area where I'm looking at the time that I'm looking at? And that's a big question. 
um, because there is a big difference with newspapers with compared to any other genealogical record group that we work with. You know, when we talk about vital records, we talk about census records, you know, we're talking about records that were generated and, and, and uh, put together by the government. And typically there's a start date, typically uh, there's kind of one main place where it's housed and then you're going to go from there. You know, there is some structure to how these records are created and how they're archived. And then you get into newspapers. And now you're talking about private companies who are all over the country. Uh, the papers come and go. Sometimes they'll be in business for 10 years. They'll shut down. Five years later, they've started back up. Maybe they've gone under a new name. Um, it's, a, it's a really moving target. And uh, fragmented is the best way I can describe it. Just newspapers anywhere and everywhere uh, with a huge variety of locations where they might be archived anywhere from your closet to uh, an archive to a library to online websites to uh, just a wide range of places so and of course in all different formats so we have a lot there to work with so these three cool tools which are not genealogy tools per se they do a great job for the genealogist to locate these papers and we're going to talk about websites that have digitized newspaper content of course that's a growing area uh, there was a time when we kind of thought, oh, how will they ever get all the census online? How will they all, you know, ever get all these passenger lists? And then they achieve it. So while not all newspapers are online yet, there's a lot of optimism for the direction that we're going in terms of online content. And top tips to remember. There are some key things that we're going to talk about uh, that I really want you to know before you set out there, because it's easy to get on a kind of a wild goose chase and there are some things if you keep these things in mind they're going to help guide you and they're going to help make sure that you're not spinning your wheels needlessly but you're really um, as quickly as possible getting what it is you're looking for. So let's talk about first these key family history information uh, this information that you're going to find in historical newspapers vital records it's a wonderful vital records substitute um, certainly we're talking births and deaths and marriages and divorces you're also going to possibly find a reference to a maiden name and we are always looking for uh, you know resources that could help lead to maiden names so that's going to be good photographs you know, and oftentimes we don't think about photographs because we're thinking about these articles and, and we certainly want to expand our thinking beyond obituaries, which is the, probably the first thing that people think of in newspapers, but there's so much more. And you might get lucky and you may find photographs of ancestors. You're also going to gain an awful lot of insight into their community. And if you're like me, the context of their lives is just as critical to you as the names and the dates and the places. And so the more you learn about their community and the world at large, the more you will understand what forces were at work at the time that they were living. And those forces, of course, impact um, what they're going to be doing and what decisions they would have made. You'll also very likely come across names of their friends and their relatives, and of course these our, our leads, right? When, when you feel like you've got a cold case and you come across an article that has mentioned a couple of uh, relatives, a couple of friends, something that they were doing together, all of a sudden you have new leads, new people to track down and see if you can't find your ancestor again in some kind of combination with them uh, and that may just open up a door for you. At which of course gives you clues for your next record search and um, that's what we're always looking for, those fresh leads. <laughs> so uh, it's really limitless in terms of what you can find in old newspapers, but uh, in my book, How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers, I do have a, a very comprehensive checklist, and it's the idea being that you could copy this and take it with you, or put it in a PDF form, you know, and um, have it on your iPad, your iPhone, so that you really are checking back with this list and keeping all of these areas in mind in addition to some of the more classic types of things you're going to find so that you can keep your eyes open. And, and let me show you some working examples of things that you might be able to find. Now, of course, uh, events involving your ancestors 
um, are critical. These are the things that they were doing in their lives. And of course, sometimes they're a minor player. Now, I found this article, this page, and I went, ooh, wouldn't it be great if some of these people were, uh, these images were my ancestors. Oh, well, then you realize they're outlaws. OK, maybe not. We don't want Dillinger as an outlaw, as an as a ancestor. But in the article to the right that I've done some highlighter pen around, there was an article um, that was talking about an ancestor of mine and his stepfather and this plan for some hotel building and, and the reasons behind it and what was going on in the Tahoe area. And what was so interesting about this was that it led to um, why, it answered a question, why this ancestor of mine died in a boating accident when he was young. And he was on a, they were, there was a postal carrier had to get on a boat to cross Lake Tahoe. And some of this was about the um, increase in uh, people living there and the way the growth that was going on. And uh, the stepfather is named here in the article, but it was, he was a minor player in the overall project, but it really had an impact on what happened and, and what that story was that I was trying to uncover in my own family history. But, you know, sometimes they take center stage. And uh, this is an example of an article that I located. Uh, this is my husband's grandfather, Raymond Cook. Now, this is the wonderful part about when your ancestor happened to live in a small town or a fairly small town. Uh, this was big news that Raymond Cook was retiring. He was the local high school band leader and uh, teacher. And so when he decided to retire, that was big news. They interviewed him, and they had this photograph that we had never seen before of he and grandma. And so that's always exciting. And, and in fact, I had somebody come up to me recently at a conference that I was speaking at and say, um, oh, well, this is all great, but you know, my ancestor was from a small town paper, and I'm not going to find that online. And, and my answer is, oh, no, be encouraged, because one, these small town papers oftentimes um, will hand over their whole archive to an online website for digitizing or to be microfilmed or whatever. But they had to fill space. They had stories. And they wanted the local people to purchase their newspaper, right? So it made sense to uh, report on what was going on in their lives. And I'll, and I'll show you some really interesting minutia, if you will, that that got covered in the paper, and that was because it really kept the readership involved. Um, so it can be very good news. Um, social news is another area. So we're talking about clubs they were involved in, even articles on who was visiting, you know, which relatives were in town visiting or where they were going to visit, parties they attended, trips they made. And again, I think you're going to find this is more common in small town newspapers and local newspapers um, because, again, they had room to report on it. So here are some examples um, from my own research. Uh, this one's kind of fun. The one on the left, OK, that's my mom on the tricycle. <laughs> and I don't know if you recognize this. Uh, those of you who uh, lived through the 60s, uh, they're these ladies were part of a women's club that my mom belonged to, and they were doing a laugh-in party of some type. So that's my mother doing her Ruth Buzzy impression. Yes, I, you can see where all this um, outgoingness comes from. <laughs> um, my mom was on a little trike and doing her Ruth Buzzy. And I remember that day. That's what was so funny about finding this article, was it brought back a memory I haven't thought about in I don't know how many years. I remember the day that she was putting that costume together and wanted to, she was taking our trike out the door. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, no, 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 it's OK. I'm like, are you going to bring it back? You know, so it's funny how the memories can flood back when you can find something like this. And as you can see, was very fortunate to get a photograph. In the center is my mother-in-law, uh, a little more classic women's club there that you see. Um, she's in the center with the uh, pillbox hat. And, um, and then the next one over is my great-grandmother. Mrs. Herring, 85, is honoree at birthday party. So yes, if, if a person uh, it, more advanced in age was having a birthday party and they listed all of the guests and where it was held um, on, at 531 West 16th Street and cake and punch was served, I mean, lots of names here. This was really neat because not only do I recognize family names, but I see mention of 
friend names, and some of these names had appeared on photographs I have in my own collection. So this really helped me make the connection and further identify who was in my photographs and why were they taking this person's picture and clarify that this was a friend, not a relative. Do you see that the way these resources work together is, is really cool. But then a little girl, the final one here on the right, birthday is celebrated by Barbara Sexton. This is a distant cousin of mine, and you know I think she was, what, five years old or, or seven years old? And it lists all the little girls that came to the party. So really fun, the, the wide range of information that you can get in terms of social news. So don't miss the social column when you're heading to the obituaries, right? Um, other newspaper gems, school events. You know, we're talking grade school through college productions, events, graduation, honor rolls, these are all things that I have found in newspapers where they did full listings of all the names of all the people involved in these events. Um, so that can be really, um, really helpful. Here are some examples. Found uh, the, I guess what do you call it, the, the band leader? <laughs> the guy with the baton, you know, at the front of the band. Um, had a photo of him that was, I think, from 1945. And in the center there, we've got the rural school and home. It was an ongoing column in this newspaper, and um, it listed some re relatives of ours. And then I love this one of the Lottie Grunsky sixth grade pupils. I have an ancestor in that picture. And it not only names him, but all of the friends and all of the faces together. And I did recognize names from the list that he stayed friends with and uh, were involved in his life throughout his life. Also, another area that I think it's easy to kind of overlook is classifieds and advertising. Okay, and so, and when you think about particularly online search and you're doing, um, putting in keywords and you're doing searches on some of the websites we're going to talk about, remember that sometimes these can actually show up in a, in a um, advertising or a classified and so when you read the snippet that they give you the little search result it sometimes doesn't look like it's a match but you need to click through and go ahead and take a look at it because sometimes you're picking up other things um, where indeed it does mention this is your ancestor but it's just a different format than you're used to seeing in terms of a regular newspaper article. Um, so legal notices, um, oh my gosh, I found so many different advertisements for L.J. Larson and Company. That's the one on the left there. This is my husband's great-grandfather in Minnesota, and it was really interesting going through all the years of these advertisements to see the evolution of his business. Um, because the kinds of things he was advertising, the way he was talking about it, really showed how that business um, grew over the decades. And of course, vital records. And I wanted to put these up here for a couple of uh, important reasons. One, remember that sometimes you're just talking a line or two. Uh, the one on the left is my uncle and his birth, and it was literally just you know two lines. Uh, the marriage in the center is my grandparents, and again, very cryptic. This was out of a Nevada newspaper, and um, uh, but it was really great because it showed her maiden name and certainly uh, their ages and that kind of thing. But the one on the right um, is an is a example of an of an obituary of sorts. And what happened was my great grandfather, I, I had the date, I knew exactly when he died, and it was in a fairly small town paper here in California. So I'm looking through microfilms at the State Library. And I know which date I'm looking for. And I go there and he is not listing the obituaries. So of course I go one week prior just in case I'm off on a date. I certainly went one to two weeks later to see if maybe they just listed it later and I could find nothing and it didn't make any sense because I, I was sure that he had died in this town. Well I have a little habit and my habit is I always go to the front page of any issue that I'm looking at to just kind of get an overview of what's going on in the community and what's going on in the world. And it's a wonderful way to also source your records. So anytime, this is a little tip, if you find an article, uh, go to the front page and take a copy of that as well. Because one, it's going to give you all the source citation information that you need. It's so easy to be grabbing articles and come home and realize, oh my gosh, I don't have the date. Because the date doesn't appear on the page near where the article was. You need that source citation, so it does that for you. But it also gives you what's going on in, you know, what's front page news locally and internationally. Well, in this case, it also included my great-grandfather's obituary.
turns out they considered him to be a pioneer resident and he was laid to rest and it was big news in that town so he was on the front page so here's the reminder yes you look at the most logical places first but remember uh, there's always exceptions and you have to think of it in terms of the perception of the people involved at the time not your perception of that person but their perception and to them at that time it was big news that he was a pioneer of their town and of course events affecting their lives and I just want to make sure you're thinking beyond the person into their employer their community natural disasters that may have occurred so here's an example of you know take a copy of the front page you're going to get local news you're going to get uh, national international and then after I got a lot of information about an ancestor who lived um, in San Francisco at the time of the great earthquake I went back and did a lot of research pulling old um, articles that taught me a whole lot more about what was it like to live through that time and that also led to more answers about the decisions that they made eventually to leave San Francisco so it uh, definitely helps the context but here's the big question we talked about which papers existed okay we know that we have an ancestor in mind but where do we look we're going to look in the town where they lived. We're going to look in neighboring towns. And that's an important concept because sometimes, just depending on what was going on with the paper, it may have actually been reported, again, from their perspective, uh, more importantly, on the cover of the neighbor town versus the town that he was in. But countywide, an example of this would be I was looking for that same great-grandfather's uh, naturalization. And I knew that they had had some kind of a ceremony. So I thought, I'll look around the time uh, that he became naturalized as, as a citizen and see if I can find an article. There was nothing in his town paper. But I stopped and I thought, hmm, where's the county seat? Okay, oh, and I went to that town and their paper and it was front page, there was a photograph and listed were all the names of the people who had received their citizenship that day and of course that included great grandpa. So, huge payoff. And out of newspaper, out of area newspapers, um, and particularly close relatives. If you know where relatives lived, that story may have been picked up and reported clear across the country, because either that person had been originally born there, or he's got all kinds of relatives there, and some of those relatives may have been longtime citizens of the original town where he lived. They moved, so they sent that story over there. There's a lot of reasons why a story could end up in a different location. So again. As we're thinking of online search particularly, and you're finding results, and you see the name looks good, the date looks good, but oh, that location looks way off, go and click on it and look at it, because you might find it's just a reporting of it in another location. And of course, there are foreign language newspapers, and one of the resources I have I'm going to show you will give you some leads for that, but keep those in mind, um, because those can be wonderful resources as well. Now, a, a, quite a while ago, uh, a listener of my Genealogy Gems podcast sent me uh, an email question and said, I want to know when the first newspapers came out in Leroy Genesee, New York. And so he says, I went to Google and Bing and I typed, when did the first newspapers come out in Leroy Genesee, New York? And all I got were a lot of Genesee and newspaper websites. Is there a website that will tell me when the first newspapers came out? And the answer is absolutely yes. Okay? first thing you're going to do before you hit these tools that we're going to talk about is you need some kind of a newspaper research worksheet because the question he's asking is has a lot of potential to kind of get unwieldy okay because the papers could be anywhere so I have a, a worksheet this one I'm showing you that's in the book you're certainly if you get the book you're welcome to copy that you can um, use it over and over again or just get yourself a yellow notepad with lines and Fill in the basics, but start yourself some kind of a case file for this, if you will, as you do your search, because chances are it may not be in one sitting that you get the answer, and so you're going to want to be able to pick it back up and take off where you left off and not duplicate your effort. But number, the first thing you're going to do is identify the location and the time frame when they lived. So he might be looking for you know John Smith, but he lived in Genesee uh, County. In, in New York, and um, maybe it was 1850. Whatever it was, those are the, that's the criteria. And then we're going to hit these three cool tools that are going to help you take that criteria and pinpoint which papers might have been available. 
Okay. Tool number one, Stanford Newspaper Data Visualization. Doesn't really sound like a genealogy site, does it? But this one is a hardworking site that does some great stuff. So let's go take a look at it, okay? Easiest way to get there, do a Google search, Stanford Newspaper Visualization, because the website address itself is really long. And here you'll see it in the results. The page shows up. Here we get to the website, and you can see that URL is kind of unwieldy. And we're at Stanford University, which is not too far from where I live, over in Palo Alto. And um, they have a department that's put together. They were looking for the growth of newspapers across the United States. They wanted to show the history. Click View the Map, because this is the heart of the tool. What you're going to be able to do here is there is a time slider at the top that they've put here. And you can go, and you can see it starts quite early, 1690. And as you move your time slider, to the right, and you're coming up in time. The date is going to show up here in the top right-hand corner. So this is the date where your slider is currently. And of course, you can see that the newspaper representation on the map is evolving and filling up that map, showing all the papers, pinpointing them by location uh, as to which ones were available at that time. So it makes sense. You go back in time, you've got fewer dots on the screen. You go forward in time, you're going to have a whole lot of dots. We're going to go over here to the area of California, where I live and where I was doing some research. And you can see that a very large dot um, is showing a huge area, the San Francisco Bay Area. But these smaller dots, you just hover your mouse, and it will tell you which town it's looking at. And depending on which dot you select, you can see the arrow is pointing to that it's indicating which newspapers are available for that location in 1901 because I put my time slider on 1901. So here, San Francisco, California, I've selected 1901, the time slider. I can hide the details to see more of the map, but right now I want to see this results list. And I can click through to these hyperlinked newspapers. And these are all tied in from a wonderful free website. It's through the Library of Congress. It's called Chronicling America, Historic American Newspapers. And um, this is an ongoing project. So if you haven't visited in a while, you may find that there are lots of new papers here. And they've been continuing to get grants. You can click through and go to libraries that have this paper. So I've, I've identified the examiner. Click libraries that have it. And it's going to show me, OK, the Michigan State University in Lansing, Michigan has this paper. Who thought of that? I mean, I would have been looking in California. So that's one way. So we go back and we can readjust our time slider. Um, like we're back in 1865. There are earlier papers now, fewer of them. But in the San Francisco Bay Area, I've got all of these listed here. Shows time frames, which I really like. So I can kind of home in on the one that looks like it's hit, hitting the right time frame. 1856 to 1878. And you can see it looks much like a card catalog um, listing. But here's the wonderful part. There's the digital record. So Chronicle in America has put a huge effort uh, in working with other organizations to digitize these newspapers. And boy, you are so fortunate when you find a newspaper. Most are listed, but um, a small handful, not I say small, r relatively speaking, there are lots of digitized papers on here, but still it's growing, and there's still a, large, a small number of them. But if you're fortunate and it has these papers, the viewer does a wonderful job of helping you see this. Um, and you can grab the screen. You can move you know, the page around. You can jump from image to image. Uh, you can switch from issue to issue, clicking this button. So great ways to maneuver through these papers. Over here on the right are foreign language papers. So you can see they're color coded. Um, there aren't a lot here, but of course you go further east in particular, and depending on the time frame, you're going to find here these are German papers. They're color coded orange. The hyperlinks are orange. And um, again, they're telling us whether it's in English, whether it's in German, whether it was a weekly paper, the time frame, the decades that it spanned. Um, so just a wonderful way to really get a sense of is foreign language, are foreign language papers even something you want to pursue? And it's encouraging to see, hey, these were in English, but these were in German. So that is the Stanford Newspaper Data Visualization. 
I really encourage you to go take a look at it. And remember, again, it's pulling from the Chronic Clean America website. Um, it's a growing website that continues to have resources, you know, put towards it. And I think you're going to find more and more digitized papers there. The second tool is newspapermap.com. Um, this is a fairly new website, and it's been a bit under construction, if you will. So things are evolving, but it really has a lot of the same wonderful features as the Stanford one. If we come up here, we can do newspapermap.com. And here's the website. Now, I've been noticing it's been changing day to day, so this might look a little bit different. I think they're actually working right now to have banners across the top, but this gives you a sense of you can enter the location. So you've got Salt Lake City, and what you're looking at is kind of like Google Maps. There's going to be a dot. You click on the dot, and it shows you modern day papers. So you're always in current day mode when you first start with newspapermap.com. You can zoom in and out. You can even use their Street View tool, which uh, the new Street View now with Google Maps is the little yellow peg man up there in the right-hand corner. But here's the historical button. Sometimes it says historical. Sometimes it says H-I-S-T period. And again, it's because I think they're working on the interface. But different little teardrop buttons pop onto the map. And when you click on them, you see the name of the paper, the location, and when it's digitized, you'll see an image. You can click through, and it will take you to where that image originates from. In this case, the one that I've clicked on does come from Chronicling America, but this is not the only source of newspapers for Newspaper Map. In fact, they're being quite ambitious. They really, really are striving to get lots of different resources and, and places where they're going to draw from. But again, you can see that the viewer here is, is wonderful. So here we're looking at modern day uh, maps. When we click historical, we're going to see the teardrop, which are the historical older images. Now I put Seattle in the first box, but that's actually if you have a title for the paper. So you come down to the second box, that's place or, or address. And here in the Seattle area, there's a couple of them of note. We're going to click historical, and we've got one. Okay. So when you click on the place marker, that's going to show the image. Here's the Daily Republican. And they're very honest. If they don't know the time frame, they're going to put question marks. They don't know exactly when this started and when it stopped. Um, you can also go back and select, I want to see all papers. Um, and here we're looking at a modern day paper. But isn't it nice? This could come in quite handy. There's all these translations. It, it taps into Google Translate. And this is a really a big help when you want to go international. And that's one of the big differences between Newspaper Map, because they are really striving to connect you to newspapers worldwide. Here we are over in the UK. Uh, Stanford's was about showing the history and evolution of newspapers, and that was only for the US. So if I come over here to Germany, let's say, you can see in the um, right-hand side we've got some color coding. Blue is German. Now this is a modern-day paper. I think, oh, well, this would be really interesting to look what is it like there today. Ah, but this paper is in German. <laughs> I don't speak German. Um, but you can select English from that little teardrop place marker, and it will give you this newspaper translated into English. OK, so we're going to click on it again. And instead of just clicking the image, we're going to click English, which is going to bring up the newspaper. And here we go. Now, you notice it still has some German text on there. Why? Because that's an image. It's an image file. It's not typed text. Everything that was typed text on this website has been translated. Uh, Google Translate cannot translate uh, words that appear in images. Okay, so, so just remember that as you work with this. And then the translation tool is up at the top. You can continue to use it if you want. But we'll head back to newspapermap.com. So you can see it's very robust. There is a lot of content here. Historical, the historical button is the one that you wanted. And in fact, not long ago, they took that off because they were working on a new interface. And I ran to them and, and said, no, 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 there's genealogists who are using this. So they've put it back on. It might be abbreviated. Um, but 
in the long run, they're going to have a lot of great stuff. Now, did you notice in that place mark I just showed you that there was an X, like the image link had been broken? Don't let that stop you. If you see that, that means at some point there was a digital image like the ones you see here. It's just that it, the link was broken. So go ahead and click it. You know, don't take no for an answer. Go in there and see if you can't find it. And sure enough, there were digital papers uh, online for that newspaper. Now, there's a couple of other um, options here as well. And here we can show you in Canada. Here's a, a uh, foreign language paper. We can like if we find something. We say, hey, I want to tell people about it on Facebook. I know I've got other people who are also researching uh, foreign language papers or papers in Indiana or where, wherever it is that you're researching. It's kind of fun. This can really generate some, some interest and some collaboration. You can filter by language if you want. Um, they're also looking this add and corrections. If you find something that you think is wrong or you, they don't know what the dates are, but you do, you can send them information. They really see this as a collaborative effort. So you want to be able to send them a notice and say, hey, I just found another one. You might want to add it to your site. And they are compiling it. It might not come on immediately, but I think you'll find that uh, they are very anxious to make this as comprehensive as possible. And you can tweet what you find, and you can Google Plus it and all that kind of stuff. You can even uh, you know, donate uh, to the site or donate information to the site as we were talking about. So this is a wonderful resource. Doesn't come from the genealogy community, but it certainly can do the job that we do. And and that's really one of the things I try to focus on in the kind of work that I do, is that we know that there are some wonderful uh, genealogy industry opportunities, but what's outside of it? What can we look at and say, hey, how can we leverage that technology for what we're trying to do in our research. And um, I, I hope you're seeing some of the potential of the kinds of things that are out there that are not in our sphere, but are absolutely available to us. The third one falls in that same category, and that's worldcat.org. Now, my guess is you might have heard of this. You might have even visited the website. But I'm also thinking that it's possible that you may have overlooked a couple things that it can really do for you. And I know I certainly did when I first started using it. So let's go take a look at worldcat.org. This site really strives to be the card catalog of all libraries. And what I recommend is get yourself a free sign-up registration, OK? And this is what's going to activate all the tools for you and not just the limited ones. So for example, if I come here and I want to say, where can I find resources? Indiana newspapers, OK? And so this is going to search the world's libraries. Not every single library, but boy, they've got a lot of them. Over here, you can narrow, OK? So you can click newspaper. There's 734 versus our original results list was much larger than that, 4,800. You could even home right down into e-newspaper, there's 14 that are some kind of digital content. It may or may not be digitized newspapers. It might be an e-book about newspaper research. But the point is it's digital content that you can access online. And so we see, OK, here's the Indiana Tribune. And you can even break it down, you saw, by year on the left-hand column. Use that column to your advantage to really get into the specific area that you want to get. Here is this particular item. Uh, it's got all the listings for where you can find this particular item. If you put in a different zip code, it's going to organize these items in order to which they are near you, OK, near this zip code, which is really helpful if there's a lot of different options as to where you can get the item. Um, you can add this item to your list. You say, hey, this is wonderful. I want to create a list of Indiana newspapers. Okay, so this really becomes a work area for you in terms of working with books and online resources and anything that comes out of libraries. So it becomes part of my Genealogy Gems, which is my account, becomes a list in my, in my free account. So I have my Indiana newspapers list. I've got an East Prussia research list. Because let's face it, sometimes we find a great resource, but we don't have time to go get that book today, or even to finish that book today. And so here's a way you can manage all the materials you're finding. You can even take notes here. 
And you can say, hey, look, I've already looked at this one, but I want to keep track of it. So I, I don't want to certainly check it out again right away. <laughs> you ever find yourself checking the same book out twice? And I know it happens to me. Um, you can also say, hey, I was reading this book I left off on a particular page. Okay, so use this to your research advantage to monitor which resources and books and, and items that you have found that would be valuable to you, why they're valuable to you, where you left off on them, when you plan on doing them, or whether you want to say, hey, I want to do this, uh, get this book when I go there on my next trip. You can tag these items so that you can very quickly and easily sort them by topic. So uh, that's all to your advantage in terms of managing resources. You don't have to be afraid of getting too big a list because you don't feel like you're going to get to it all at once. You can manage them from here. But here's the thing. You're not the only person who's doing this kind of research. So you go to WorldCat and you say, I'm going to search lists. I'm going to look for Indiana genealogy. Who else has an Indiana genealogy list? Because here's the idea. Why should I reinvent the wheel? Maybe somebody else. And oh my gosh, this person has Randolph County, Indiana genealogy. I even recognize that last name as being one in my own family tree. And so I, I go to look at this person's list and I realize, oh my gosh, he's found some great stuff. And I can add these items to my list. Uh, I can watch the list. So if I think, well, this guy looks like he knows what he's looking for, I want to be notified if he finds something new and adds it to his list. I want to perhaps add some of these items. So you can see my list watching. There is the one that I'm watching. I have my own lists. So this is really leveraging the power of social media and you know the web 2.0, if you will, the idea that we can learn and and work off of each other's successes. Uh, here's another search. I wanted to look up, we talked about San Francisco newspaper, San Francisco. There's 5,600 you know, results. I'm going to come over here and click in newspapers, get it down to about 530. There's 12 that are digitized content. And here was one that caught my eye as I was working on this, thinking, hmm, the San Francisco call. I've heard that paper. Now, you see how there's three listings? Don't disregard or think that they just made a mistake. There might be three different ways to access this paper. The first one is Library of Congress. But I, you go back and you click the next one. Ah, now we are pulling from the California Digital Newspaper Collection. This site is phenomenal. And I realized here I was jumping to a conclusion, oh, they just made a mistake and duplicated the, the links, but they didn't. They're pulling from different resources. So explore, explore, explore. And um, the San Francisco call, all of that content was digitized, searchable, downloadable. I could add that to a list. I could go check out other people who have lists for San Francisco newspapers, see what they're looking at. I can uh, say, oh, I want to mark some of those, um, res res those uh, items in my own list as well to pursue later. And this one, there were a lot of different places. I took out this New York area zip code, and I put my zip code in, and look what happens. I went from the New York Public Library to the Oakland Public Library. And it's interesting, WorldCat will even tell you, hey, this is only 18 miles from your house. So all of a sudden, something that I thought I might have to do interlibrary loan to get, or have a, somebody do a lookup, Ah, I can drive just down the road and I can get it myself. And there's all kinds of mobile devices. They have a free app. Uh, if you are an iGoogle user, they do have an iGoogle gadget. So uh, that's something that I teach in, on my Genealogy Gems website. I have a whole series of videos and premium membership about converting Google to a customized genealogy dashboard. And uh, Amer these websites like WorldCat have specific little gadgets so you can have them right there on your Google homepage. So there you've got three great tools that just do a bang up job on getting you to what's available in a location at a particular time frame and showing you whether it's going to be offline or online because the thing is our search always starts online now. That's really changed. It very often will end offline. And that's where the worksheet comes in. It keeps us on track. It lets 
helps us know where to go and where we've been and where we're going. So just remember, it's, you're, you're going to have to be a little flexible here and, you know, follow the path. And it may or may not be online or offline. It doesn't matter because the goal is to get that paper. So let's give you some more help for identifying newspapers that match location and date. Because certainly, as really comprehensive as these three were, they just cannot cover everything. And in particular, I want to mention to you that WorldCat not only draws from all the public libraries, and, and they have to be members of WorldCat, but most are. Sometimes if funds are really, really tight, they don't join because there's a cost involved. But in general, you're going to find most are, are members, but it's also international libraries. It's also corporate universities. You see what I'm saying? It really expands the concept of library to all the libraries that are out there and available to the public. It's just that some we don't as readily think of, or we don't think of them as being available to us, but they really are. And you want to talk to your local librarian and, and the reference librarian about interlibrary loan. That's going to be a real key. But there are more state archives. These folks, the state um, librarian at the State Archives is going to know so much about what is available in the state that you're researching. And I found a wonderful little list that's worth taking note of. It's at statearchivists.org slash states. And here's the key. Sometimes we know, oh, you know, you go to the State Archivists and you're trying to find it in a Google search, but this is just one nice little cheat sheet by state with addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, links to the website, everything that you need to get a hold of your state archivist. And they can be a wonderful um, resource for pointing you in the direction of where they know that, that the best, um, our best repositories of newspapers are for that state. The U.S. Newspaper Program is one of the programs, it was a volunteer project that fed, feeds papers into the Library of Congress, Chronicle in America. Uh, their website is well worth visiting and has a wonderful little map that you, again, can click on by state to locate um, newspapers. I also recommend look for the U.S. Gen Web Project. This is a volunteer project. It's a free website. You go to the state, then you go to the county level, and you'll you oftentimes find a link to local area resources for newspapers because the, you know, the folks who manage these websites are devoted to research in that area. And if you don't find the links that you need, you often find people who will do lookups for you or that you can ask questions of. So it's a wonderful collaboration kind of a place. And here's another one you just have to know about. Um, you know, my, my book, I couldn't believe as I was compiling the lists of websites and resources. It's immense. And so I've broken it down by state and then by country. Um, but one of the ones that really shines bright in the list is the Penn Library's History Research Guides. Um, it's a guides to historical newspapers online. They are by state. You go to this uh, Get Help. And what I would recommend is just go to Google and search Penn Libraries history research guides and maybe throw in the word newspapers and this one's going to come up they they've got some wonderful content themselves that they've archived but they've also got these research guides to help you to locate newspapers and it's not just in Pennsylvania it's uh, world um, I don't think it's worldwide I think it's nationally here's some more options for you um, the reference librarian at your state library uh, which sometimes can be different than your state archives. This list is just like the state archivist list, and it's going to give you the state library, the address where it's located, all the contact information. Um, it's a wonderful, comprehensive list. Also check with your local genealogical or historical society. They're just going to be a wonderful resource for you. And I found a couple of lists that do that same kind of cheat sheet <laughs> layout on their website. Um, one is this censusfinder.com, and it's slash genealogy-society-directory. But FGS, which is the Federation of Genealogical Societies, also has a list of all their members. And of course, many, many site, uh, societies are members of FGS, and so this is a great way to, to quickly find the society for the area that you're looking for. Um, but you know, historical societies, genealogical societies, they've always got somebody in there who's in the know. And of course, do you remember when I was talking about the podcast listener and he was saying how he typed in, you know, how do I find newspapers for this? <laughs> that kind of that entire sentence kind of search. You know, most of us have come to realize that there's keyword searches are a little more effective when it comes to Google. But uh, if you would like to 
get more uh, in tune with what Google needs to hear from you to get great searches. Um, I did write a book on that, the Google Toolbox. Um, but here's an example. If, if I was looking for San Francisco newspapers, I would put San Francisco in quotation marks because that's a mandatory phrase that I want to appear in the results. And then I would have the word newspapers. Now, not long ago, we used to put plus newspapers, and that was a way of saying it's got to have this word. But now plus has taken on a whole new meaning with Google Plus. So we won't go there. We just, just know whether it's a word, singular, or whether it's a phrase. We put it in quotation marks now to make sure that it's a mandatory find. It's going to be absolutely on the pages that are given to us in our results. But you can also narrow by time frame. This is one of those tips I put in the book that I find a lot of people don't use, but boy, it's perfect for genealogy. Type in a time frame, 1850.1900 means that web page in the results you get must include some date that falls between 1850 and 1900. So this is a way sort of to narrow down the search. And I found, oh, when I did a newspaper search the first time with these criteria, I got all these Wikipedia entries that I didn't want. So I went back, revised my search, minus Wikipedia. What does that do? It just takes all those Wikipedia results and tosses them because we don't want that word involved. This is just a small example of how you can very quickly get a much more effective search query than just typing in that sentence for what it is you're looking for. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can go to Google for genealogy.com, which is one of my websites, and um, I've got more resources in the book there for you. But just know that there's a possible, there are ways to improve those results you're getting. So here is an example of when I used this search query that I put together. I got some wonderful um, resources here. SF Genealogy turned out to be a gold mine. <laughs> there were so many things. You see, the, re the research guides.net had a wonderful list. Just really quality results. That's the goal, is you want fewer results of higher quality, okay? So top websites to search, um, once you identify the newspaper, check these major websites to see if this paper has been digitized or is online. And here's a tip, you don't have to have a paid subscription right out of the gate to get value from subscription websites, because there's still a really good resource for determining which newspapers have actually been digitized. So here's a list. Unfortunately, in our, our webinar, we don't have time to go through and do lots of specific searching in each one. Um, but I want to make sure that you kind of know what the top dogs are in this, in this area and get them on your list. Go in there and search. And even if you don't have a subscription, take a look at the little snippet results. This is going to lead you. And then maybe you take that result and you go to WorldCat and you do a search on the name of that paper for that time frame, and you see if maybe there are some free resources available. Or you may find, you know what, this is digitized, it's online, this is worthwhile. Go ahead and get your subscription. It'll be worth the cost, considering the time, the gas money, you're going to save the whole thing. So the first two here are free. Again, I want you to have the direct link to chroniclingamerica.loc.gov, uh, which, of course, Stanford pulled from, and so did Newspaper Map. Uh, Google News Archive, here's the important thing to know. Um, I believe they are no longer digitizing new content, um, you know, new collections. But the existing collection as it was is still in existence. It's still out there. It covers 1840 to current. It's a wonderful resource. And then for the paid subscription sites, you're looking at Ancestry, Genealogy Bank, Newspaper Archive, uh, World Battle Records, which is now under My Heritage. Um, these are all ones with very large collections that I think would be worth um, taking a look at. And so finally, I want to give you top five newspaper tips, okay? These are things I want you to keep in mind as we come to the end of our hour, and I don't know what in the world happened to our hour, but it's almost gone. Um, first of all, only a fraction of newspapers are visible online, and uh, I think the iceberg kind of demonstrates that. So let's go back and say, when we start our search, we take it down, put it on paper, the criteria, we get our little worksheet going, we've got a checklist of all the kinds of things that we might be able to find, and we start online with our three cool tools. We then go into the other free websites. Uh, we might talk to the state archivist, the state librarian. We're going to look at the paid websites, see if we're getting search results. 
and see if those papers are showing up online and make our decision about um, subscriptions from that point. But the point is, is that while today a small fraction are actually digitized and online, it's growing so fast. This is the record area that is kind of an untapped resource, and I think that we're going to, I would predict, this is just me, but I really think that you're going to find genealogy sites, once they really feel like they're up to speed on everything else, there's going to be a push to see who can do this, because newspapers are so exciting, and they really do need to be digitized in order to be searchable in a, in a realistic way. As you can imagine, just going page to page in a microfilm reader really narrows down what you can look for. You can't just read every last column. It's too much. So I think we're going to see in the next, dare I say, five years, um, a huge boom in the area of newspaper research coming online. Another tip is I just want to make sure that you are aware that newspapers are a secondary source. And this is really important to keep in mind. Um, not only are we going to get that front cover page of the paper, make sure we cite our source, that we get that information, the title, the publisher, the year, the issue date, whatever you know, the, the information is that we need to make sure that we can cite that source properly. We do need to understand that newspapers are a secondary source. Um, this is written at a time after the incident by somebody who may or may not have been closely involved at all with what's being reported on. And that makes it secondary. So what does that mean for you as the researcher? It means this is your lead. There may be really good data here, but now you need to take that and you need to go verify it with a primary source document, um, something that was created at near or right at the time of the event by somebody who was intimately involved in the event, that's going to be your prime kind of primary resource. And so don't stop with the newspapers. And of course, take your salt shaker with you because you need a grain of salt with everything that you read in the paper, dare I say. Um, because as we know, uh, things get transcribed, things get typos. Uh, sometimes it's just propaganda. Who knows? But we have to make sure that we follow through with the primary sources. And I want to recommend that as you work, um, you create a go-to bookmark file. Now, what I did in my book was in the, in the appendix where you've got by um, state and then by country, I leave spaces so that as you're finding other websites, and they are coming online all the time, you can add them so you've got this constantly growing resource book of where to find newspapers and newspaper leads and information online. Um, bookmark them. Take advantage. I know if you haven't used your bookmark uh, feature on your browser in a while, go back and reacquaint yourself with it. Create a folder for newspapers, perhaps even folders within that folder for locations where you might be searching or let's say surnames that you'll be putting these into. And start marking them as you go because you need that little breadcrumb trail to know where you've been. And another tip, look to the future. Remember what I was talking about, you might be in a, in a website like Genealogy Bank, let's say, and you put in this information, you've got a criteria, a time frame, a person, a location, and you get a result and you think, well, that all looks right, but why is it 2001? That doesn't make sense. And it's easy to disregard those because you're focused on 1922, okay? But what I found was I was looking for papers where the paper from the original time frame didn't exist any longer. I couldn't find a repository that had it, whether it was online or offline. But the, that paper today, and remember I showed you some of those three cool tools, show us modern day papers. Papers today oftentimes have one of those looking back in time columns or in the good old days, and they'll have a column where they're reprinting newspaper articles from 50 years ago, 75 years ago, 100 years ago. And this is a gold mine for getting those articles, particularly those hard to find ones. So just because the date isn't correct, with lined up with what your criteria is, uh, take time, go look at it and see. Because in this case, I found an article from 1952 that mentioned uh, the marriage of my husband's parents, uh, which was wonderful. It was, it was reprinted 50 years later. Here's another example. 75 years ago, on January 28th of 1926, um, you know, this gal got married, and here's all the detail, and this article I could not find uh, at the time that I located it 
in modern day papers in this twice told tales column. Um, at the time, it wasn't available for the 1926 original. So, boy, that can really hit the mark. And finally, be sure and ask for help. I, you know, it's so easy to get your head down and you're buried into this work. And as I said, I, I totally sympathize that newspapers is a very convoluted kind of a search to do. And we look at website after website, and we forget they're almost all of them have that contact us link. You've seen that there. You know, take advantage of the immense knowledge of reference librarians and um, the people who put these sites together. They do it because they care. They do it because they have knowledge and expertise in this area. And don't be shy. I know sometimes we feel like if we click contact us, I'll never hear back. My email will go into a deep, dark black hole. And Maybe it will. That could happen. It doesn't cost you anything, right? <laughs> but I find more often than not, I do get a response. Sometimes it's a week later or two weeks, but oftentimes it's just a day or two. And if I'm very pleasant and I have enough information for them to work with, I find that they oftentimes go above and beyond to say, hey, well, you know, you mentioned this, but what about this? And I wanted to get this to you. I, I, I went ahead and pulled it up for you. I've had that happen. Um, Folks out there in, in the librarians and the archives and everything, they're busy, and I know that they're a bit understaffed, but they're also there to serve and to help, and I know that they love when they can help contribute towards successes. I've interviewed a lot of them, and so don't go on a wild goose chase. Okay, click that Contact Us link, and uh, make sure you've got your, your ducks kind of in a row so that you've got enough data to give them to be of help to you, but then reach out and ask for some help. So. The final word here is, there's a lot of work to be done. This is not the proverbial haystack needle that you might think that it is. This was an old article I found uh, in an old newspaper, and I just want you to feel like that after spending an hour together, that you're, you're walking away feeling like you've got some new tools in your tool belt, that you can break up some of that concrete that kind of laid itself around some of these uh, newspapers, searches that you were contemplating, and I hope you really feel engaged and inspired to go out and take another shot at it. Um, it's, they're out there, and they are just a blast to find. I think that you're going to find it's going to break open several cold cases for you. And um, certainly, uh, you know, there's just nothing more rewarding than seeing your ancestor's name looking back at you in print. So with that, um, I'll invite Bruce back, because I really want to give away a copy of my book. Um, it's called How to Find Family History in New Your Family History in Newspapers. Um, this is kind of where the presentation all pulls from, is from this book. It's got the worksheets in it. It's got the checklist. It's got the appendix with all the, all oh, just pages and pages and pages of websites and places for you to add more, and a complete step-by-step -step on how to use those cool tools I was telling you about. So um, Bruce, if you want to join me, we can uh, perhaps pull a winner of this oh. copy of the book. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, we are going to have everybody raise their hand. Okay, I'm going to say on your mark and set go type of thing. We're going to have you raise your hand. Uh, okay, not right now. I see a bunch of hands <laughs> starting to raise. Um, what I'm going to do is I've got a little button here that will let me unraise your hands. Um, but before we do that, I just kind of want everybody to have a fair chance. So. Uh, what you'll do is on the little the little panel, the little go to webinar panel uh, that's kind of on the side of your screen. You may not be able to see it. There may be this little orange arrow. Uh, if you don't see it, click that little orange arrow, and that will expand out your little screen. And when that does it, on that little side panel, there will be a little a little hand, uh, a little button with a hand. So I want everybody to go ahead and click that button right now so we can kind of see. Okay, yeah, it looks like you all know where it's at because I'm seeing, I'm seeing a bunch of them. So I just want everybody to do it so we can kind of make sure everybody knows where that little, where that little hand thing is. So um, if you click that little button, it'll raise your hand. If you click it a second time, it unraises it. Okay, so what I'm going to have uh, Lisa do is I'm going to have her pick a number, and uh, then I'm going to um, – I'm going to say on your market set go, I'm going to uh, lower everybody's hand, and then we're going to take 
whoever raised their hand, like if she picked 30, we're going to take the person that raised their hand 30th. I can actually see the order everybody raises their hand, and we're going to uh, take that person, then that person's going to win a copy of this book. So, Lisa, go ahead and give me a number. Okay, well, um, okay, my youngest daughter is home from college right now, and um, she just celebrated her 21st birthday, and so I'm going to pick the number 21. Okay, so it's going to be the number 21. So everybody go ahead and get ready, and on your mark, get set, go. Okay, so let's go ahead and let me go down the little list here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Maybe I should have said three. <laughs> okay, 21. so. Twenty-one. Okay, so it's actually going to be. Ugh. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Okay, it's going to be Claudia Hovden, H-O-V-D-E-N. Okay. Congratulations, Claudia. Okay, Claudia Hovden. Hovden. And what I want you to do, Claudia, is, Claudia, type your, type your, um, go ahead and type your, um, your address into the questions, and that, that'll come to me, uh, and I'll pass that on to Lisa. Okay, and I think Lisa actually has a special uh, on the book for, you know, for those who didn't, uh, weren't lucky enough to win, and so you want to tell them about that? You bet. And Claudia, um, add your email address too because I want you to get the full advantage of your prize because it's going to be similar to what we have on the special. And now the book just came out in January. It's $24.95. Um, what I've got for you is I'll do a signed copy of the book for you. And if you purchase it through this website address, genealogygems.com slash news.htm, you're also going to get the ebook for free. Okay, now I sell that in my store. It's fifteen dollars and ninety-five cents just for the ebook. So here's the real huge advantage to having the ebook. There are so many websites. We just touched on a handful. There are so many wonderful websites. You're going to be able to go through and pick which one is for the area that you're looking for. But if you've got it in the digital version in the ebook, and it's just a straight PDF that can go on your computer, it can go on your smartphone, it can go on your iPad. You're going to have clickable links. This is going to save you so much time. You're not going to have to type in the, the addresses and all that kind of stuff. As you're going through the book, you know, you've got the paper copy to write in your addresses, to keep it by the, the side of your computer and your desk and to work with. But then you're going to have this portable one with you on the go. It's going to have the worksheets. It's going to have the checklist. And you can just literally click on the links. They're all hyperlinked throughout all almost 200, well, about 154 pages, I think, in the book. And you're going to be able to go straight there, have it open it up in your browser. And again, I'm just hoping my, my goal is that you're going to get there quicker. And you're going to have everything that you need at your fingertips. So I know there's lots of iPad users out there, tablets, anything that can use a PDF. Uh, this ebook is going to be a, a great uh, help to you. So you get the book, it's a signed copy, shipped to your home, and you're going to get that ebook for $15.95 absolutely free. Um, so it's just genealogygems.com slash news.htm. And if by chance you are watching this recording at a later date, uh, I'm going to keep this web page up for you as, as long as I can. So um, if you're seeing it, go ahead and, and check it. We're actually working on a new website, which I'm very excited about. I, I, I'm, you guys are the first ones to hear about it, but a new website for what we, what we do at Genealogy Gems, um, but it's going to be a few more weeks. So this will be up there, and I hope that you enjoy the book. I hope that it's a, a big resource to you to help you have as much fun with newspapers as I have. And with that, Bruce, I am more than happy to answer any questions that people have. I, 
I know that there's uh, we covered a lot of material, but we can give it a shot. Okay, um, there's a couple of questions uh, that ask that uh, from some uh, some folks who already have your book, and they're wondering if there's a special on just the ebook. Um, a special on just the ebook. Oh, you know what? I will add I'll, a special. Yes, I will add one to that page. I didn't even think about that. Yes, I'll put that on the page. Let's see. What should we do? What should we do? Um, how about half price on the ebook? Would that be good? Sounds what good do you to think, me. Bruce? Oh, uh, they're saying yes, 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 yeah, yes, good. yeah. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm gonna put. You guys, get, give me one hour, and I will have that up on the website so that there'll be a half price for the ebook for anybody who, who's already got the hard copy. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'm writing it down right this second. Okay. Um, the second question that I that I saw is back on the. Back on the when you were talking about the three sites, they're wanting to know if those sites are free or if they, those are pay sites. Absolutely free. Yep, that's the beauty of it. Okay, so those three sites are, are free. Okay, um, and the single most asked question on this is, um, is there a is there a handout on this? And the answer is no. There's not a handout. Um, but we are recording the webinar, and so this webinar will be available for free forever up on our website. And um, and then the book, you know, think of that as the handout. So you know, you can you can get a copy of this book uh, if you wanted to have a hard copy, or like I say, this webinar will be available. You can you'll be able to go watch it, and um, you'll be able to watch it and. Uh, you know, pause it on the on the page with the links and, and be able to access all of that. Okay. Well, again, we'd like to thank Lisa for uh, for joining us and for sharing her her expertise uh, in on this subject. Uh, I always love I always love listening listening to her. She's uh, several people have said she's a perky uh, <laughs> speaker. <laughs> Uh, you know, and and those of you who have been listening to me know that you know that's I'm kind of on the opposite end of that scale. So, thanks, Lisa, for Nobody joining fell us. Don't asleep, though, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining us, and uh, hopefully this will help everybody uh, be able to to use newspapers to help them with their family history. And so, again, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone.